a very warm welcome to our service this morning. And let's begin our time of worship by reading a portion from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. It is a good thing for us to count our blessings and to remember all that we have in Christ and to be thankful. And so let us do that as we, as we read from Ephesians chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 3 of this passage. And we're going to read just down to verse 10. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, and all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. You know, in this little passage in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul marvels here at the great plan of redemption in Christ. We've been blessed in Christ. We're part even of God's family in Christ. We're redeemed in Christ, forgiven in Christ. And all of this has been given by the riches of God's grace. It's almost like as Paul is writing this passage, he's overflowing even with thankfulness. And so as we're reminded even today of all that God has done for us, let us give praise to God's glorious and majestic name as we sing even this opening hymn, Name of All Majesty. And we'll stand as we sing this together, please.
Let's pray together and let's come at the rest of our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are the majestic God, that you are from everlasting to everlasting. You were the one, Lord, who was there before even the world was formed, the one who formed it by your hands and by your word, Lord. But you're the one who upholds this world, Lord, even by your mighty power and how even it declares of your glory. The rising of the sun and its setting declares even of your faithfulness. How even the night sky even declares your, your vastness and your majesty. Lord, we, we're reminded even in your word that you aren't remote from your creation. Lord, you're all present. You're even near to us. Lord, you give of your son to even enter this world. That he, and that, that he would give of himself. And Lord, it shows how even your great love even for, for sinners that love was poured out when you sent your only son to give of his life for the, to be the ransom payment for our sin and to redeem us by his blood. And so, Lord, we want to give you thanks that we have a risen Savior. And we want to give thanks, Lord, even that there will be a day even when he will come again, a day even when he will one day rule and reign, and, Lord, even a day when this present world even will pass away and be replaced by a, a glorious new creation. We want to give you thanks for the sure promises of your word, or your word, and how, Lord, we are to look forward for that day, the long that your kingdom will come and will be done, your reign will be uh, done perfectly, Lord, even in this earth. And so, Lord, we, we do pray, Lord, that you would help us not to hold too tightly even to the things of this world, that we would lose sight of the glory to come. Help us not to do that, Lord. Help us to look with eyes of faith because of even the hope we have in you. And Lord, we do pray for those who are in particular need today, those either, who are either housebound or in, in nursing homes, those also in hospital. Lord, continue to uh, help and strengthen Norman at this time. And Lord, we do pray also that, uh, that folks would know that, Lord, we miss them in our assembly here. Lord, we are your people. We're part of your family. And so we do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray even for the, the regular ministries, Lord, even of the church. We pray for the work of UCB Prayer Line. We want to give thanks for all those who are being helped through that, for the work of make and do as well, and how that is an encouragement and a blessing to so many, and also a means of even reaching out as well. And Lord, help us even as we do look to the future, as we look forward even to summer clubs and, and other outreaches as well. Lord, help us even with that. And so, Lord, be glorified even as we meet today around your word. We commit it into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you've already seen the announcements um, on the, the screen uh, as well, but uh, just one further announcement. Uh, it was mentioned before how we'd like to try and start door-to-door -door work, so if anyone would be free to help with that, please let me know after the service if you've already come forward already. So I want to thank you uh, for that, for your willingness even to do that. So just to keep that in prayer. And do remember as well the outreach event that we're going to be running next Sunday night, and that's with John Cunningham and uh, so that's a family and friends event so would encourage you to invite uh, either friends or family or neighbors as well we'll have to extend it friends family neighbors but reach out to whoever you can even to come along to that next uh, sunday night where there would be uh, some refreshments after the service as well too so it's a good opportunity even to to bring people along and even to get in conversation uh, with them as well too and to reach out so do pray for that and pray for john even as he prepares for that. That's John Cunningham from Newry. So remember him in prayer. But we're going to uh, sing another hymn just now. And this one's a new hymn. We were playing it uh, a number of times uh, just before the service there. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I'm not sure how many of you have heard this hymn before, but it's a, it's a beautiful hymn and lovely words. It was played during the um, association meetings, uh, actually in the pastor's mornings. And it was, um, it was this beautiful song, Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, and it's by Sovereign Grace. And just stay seated as we, as we sing this. Hopefully you heard the tune, but if not, well, you can listen to it maybe for the first verse and then sing along if you want but we'll, we'll play this beautiful hymn and sing along if you know it
that is a beautiful song that isn't it beautiful words and beautiful tune as well and um, we'll play that again over the next uh, few weeks as well too uh, but it is such a beautiful song that all glory we go to his name even in our lives as well let's turn to the last in our series in the book of nehemiah nehemiah 13 Nehemiah 13, and as I say, the very last in our series of this. So last week, Nehemiah 12 brought us to what at first glance might have seemed like a fitting ending to the book. Because it was a reminder to all those who were involved in this work of rebuilding in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was really, he was looking back as well too. And there was a list of names that spanned nearly 100 years. And we saw the happy conclusion of the rebuilding efforts. The walls had been rebuilt and the city was beginning to be repopulated again. And that was a cause for celebration. And the people did. They celebrated. They dedicated the walls to God's glory. But it finished with Nehemiah putting measures in place that um, ensured that worship would continue at the temple. He appointed um, people to collect the necessary tithes to support the priests and Levites as they served God. But yet what we see is the book is not finished yet. There's more to come in chapter 13. But yet, maybe it's not what we expect, This how this book finishes. Let's read this together, and we'll read the whole chapter today. So Nehemiah 13, I'm beginning to read at verse 1. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber, where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, the singers and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the temple. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the, te- out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers. And I brought, them, brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So with the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasures over the storehouses Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padiah of the Levites, and as their assistant Hanan the son of Zachar, son of Madaniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses in the Sabbath, bringing in heaps of grain and, and loading them in donkeys and also wine, grapes and figs and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them in the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them in the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing you're doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way? Did not our God bring all this disaster upon us and on this city? Now you're bringing more wrath in Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I'll lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. 
Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat, out, beat some of them and, and pulled out their hair and made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take your da- their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among many nations there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made him even to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest, the son of, son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite, therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O my God, for good. And this is the word of God. Let's sing another hymn together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. And as this chorus reminds us, we are to trust in God and and obey. And if you're able to, please stand as we sing this together.
Uh, once more, before we turn to God's Word, we're going to ask for the Lord's help as we do that. But also, uh, today I want to m- uh, mention some of the Baptist Missions prayer needs as well. Um, I know a number of you get the Baptist Missions prayer line. And, but if you, if you don't, can I encourage you even to sign up to that? Um, you can get it emailed out to you every Friday afternoon. And you get just a, an, an email with um, just a list of a number of different prayer points. So we're going to remember some of those today. We're going to pray for the work of Shangle Community Fellowship and also some of the needs in, in France. It's impossible for me to pray through the whole of the prayer points in the Baptist Missions prayer line, if you've seen it. Um, but we're going to pray for, for the work in France as well. And also for Cormac and Anya Walsh as they start off in uh, Dublin as well. They're doing a new church planting work uh, down there, and I, I met Cormac actually at the at the pastors' conference uh, back there in March. So it was really interesting to meet him too. So just pray for them as they got that new work off the ground as well. And we'll continue to remember John and Lourdes as they settle back in Peru as well too. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks that you abide with all those who trust and obey. Father, we want to give thanks that, Lord, you know of our needs, you know of our hearts, and, Lord, we can bring our our prayers, and also those of even, we pray for your children as well, too. Pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just here in our own church, but we pray, Lord, even for the wider work of of Baptist missions as well. We do pray for uh, David and Pamela Dixon, Lord, at SCF. We pray uh, that as David has been given this opportunity, Lord, to be chaplain of the local football team there, we pray, Lord, even in that work as, as the chaplain of that team, that as he's had opportunities already even to, to reach out, Lord, even to the local community there. And we pray for them and their friends and family service that they're having this morning. Um, Father, just we pray that many would respond even to the invitation to come into that. And we pray, Lord, that uh, to be able to engage them in conversation, even in the tea and coffee that takes place after, Lord. And just bless them, Lord. And maybe may they see others even maybe taking an interest, Lord, even in coming along there and even coming to faith in you. Lord, we do pray for the, uh, the Sandal family in France. We pray for them, Lord, even as they um, are still acclimatizing, Lord, even uh, to the work there. Uh, even as they've applied even for these French lessons as well, that they would um, that they would happen, Lord. And we pray for them as they also take um, this man through the Christianity Explored course. Lord, we pray that you would speak to that man. We do pray that as uh, he is taken through that course, that he will come to see Christ and that he will embrace him, Lord, as Savior. And Lord, we uh, pray also for the Moore family in Paris. We pray for their girls as they take their exams at the moment and also for their church as they seek even to to, to obtain a new building. Lord, we pray that you will grant them wisdom and Lord, guide them to that right right place for them. And Lord, we do want to give thanks for for John and Lourdes' uh, safe arrival in Peru, Lord, even the previous week. Father, we just ask you to help them, Lord, even just the practical arrangements that they need to make. And also for John as he settles back into even the work there in Peru. And we do want to give thanks just for what a blessing that they have been to the work there over the years. Lord, use them in your glory and in your service. And Father, we pray for um, Cormac and Anya Walsh and uh, Ashtown in Dublin. Lord, we pray that they would be able to form a, a new leadership team, Lord, even for the new church that they seek to plant there. Lord, we pray for unity among their team. And we pray also for, for guidance for them even in the way forward as they seek to run this new discipleship course as well. And Father, how good it is, Lord, that we can be partners in the gospel. Not only giving to the work, but, but praying for the work as well. And Father, we pray for them as they indeed pray for us as well too. And Heavenly Father, we, we do pray for ourselves as well as we come to your word now. Lord, once more as we've been looking at this book of Nehemiah over the last number of months as well, how it has challenged us about many things, about our prayer life, about even our spiritual life as well, about even the task of mission as well too, and even the challenges we face in that. And Father, we pray once again, you will speak to us and encourage us and challenge us and bless us even from this important book. Father, we ask, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, impress its great truths upon our hearts and help us as we seek to live them out in our lives. Lord, we ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, let's turn to the book of Nehemiah once again, Nehemiah chapter 13. You know, the the Christian life in Scripture is often likened to a race. You find that image used in a, in a a few places in Scripture. And it is a good analogy because in any race there can be difficult periods. Times maybe where runners grow weary. Times maybe even where runners might even stumble and fall. Yet it is important to, to keep on going in the race and to press on towards the goal. But it's vital not only how we start the race, it's critical and vital that we finish that race well. And as one writer remarks, good beginnings are no guarantee of happy endings. And that's very true because while the people in Nehemiah's day may have started well, what we see is that it doesn't finish in the way you might expect. As I say before, uh, you, know, you might have expected it to finish in 12 with this great uh, celebration. And I don't know about you, but maybe when you watch a film or whenever you read a book, everyone likes that uh, fairy tale happy ending, don't you? That's the way you, you like to see it. Have you ever watched one of those films and it just, kind of, it just kind of ends and you're going, is that it? But well, hopefully you're not doing that as you get to Nehemiah chapter 13. Hopefully you're not going, is that it? Because Nehemiah has some more important things to say to us. Because actually, there's an important lesson to be drawn out of chapter 13. And there's something he wants us to see in a lesson. He wants us to keep on going, clearly, as we see this passage here. And, but it begins with an encouraging start, uh, verses 1 to 3. The people, you see, had previously recommitted themselves to God's word. They'd made a covenant to obey that word. And we see in the first three verses one of the ways in which they did that. So the covenant they declared, how they were, they were going to honor God in every area of their life. And that covered their, their business life, their, their home life as well too. And yet there was an issue that had arisen. Whenever they read God's word, they were convicted about something. And I know I've got the clicker and it's not actually clicking now. So Jim, sorry, I'm going to have to actually get you to click on there for me. Thanks. The need for holiness. The need for holiness. Talk about not finishing. Well, it looks like the clicker's finished already. <laughs> well, there we go. We'll change the batteries for later maybe. The need for holiness. Oh, don't worry about it, Jim. It's fine. The need for holiness. As they read God's word, what they find is that no Ammonite or Moabite should enter the assembly of God. So as the, in the regular reading of the word, that's what they find. They find that, um, that they, as they're reading, and it's likely the portion they were reading from, if you're making notes, Deuteronomy 23 verses 3 to 5 talk about this very thing. So maybe in the, in the regular reading of the scriptures, they came across this very passage that says, No Ammonite or no Moabite should enter the assembly of God. Now why this was, and we're told here uh, in these verses, was the particular exclusion was because of how these people had treated the children of Israel when they first left Egypt. It says they didn't meet them with bread or water. Uh, but it wasn't, just that, it wasn't just about they didn't receive a warm welcome. Because actually these people sought to actively harm God's people. These Ammonites and Moabites, they were repeatedly trying to, to harm them. Uh, they even hired a pagan prophet called Balaam to curse God's people. And yet God had overcome their wickedness and it protected his people. And to find out the background of that, you actually can read about that in Numbers 22 to 25. And what you see is these people, they were constantly enemies of God's people. It was no isolated incident, the one that's described here. Later in the book of Judges, we even read how they tried to, to block them on their way to the, the, um, the promised land even and, and attack them repeatedly. So the issue here was idolatry and hostility to Israel. So this separation from the peoples of the land. Now when it talks about these people are excluded, as I say, it's, it's for the reasons of idolatry and hostility towards Israel. It's not racism or anything like that because Ezra 6, 21 shows us how people from other nations were welcomed if they separated themselves from idols and worshipped the Lord. So people from other nations were welcomed. That's clear in scripture. And a prime example of that is actually the book of Ruth. Uh, we see how someone from another nation, a Moabite, nonetheless was welcomed. And the reason was, was because she then followed the Lord. She followed the law of God. She followed God and embraced that faith. And so in verse 3, what we have then, it's an encouraging start. Because the people read this in the word of God and they're convicted about it. As indeed when we read God's word, it's not just about re us reading that word. 
this word should read our hearts too. Because whenever we read God's word, it should, the Holy Spirit uses that word to even examine our own hearts and can convict us of our sin. Because none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And that God's word does convict us. And here they'd read this and thought, you know, we've been lax in this regard. And so in verse 3, it's an encouraging response because when they hear that word of God, they decided to separate themselves from those other nations. So they had a desire for holiness, a desire to obey God's word. But yet when you come to verse 4, you come to something a little bit puzzling because it begins now before this. Now before this. And so the writer, what the writers told us there in verses 1 to 3 was the beginning of, of some events that actually happened much later. So now he's going to tell us, here's what happened actually before we got to this point. Though they sought to obey God's word, well, it wasn't always like this. They had a few stumbles before this. So if this were a film, I used the analogy of a film already, so let's return to that for a moment. If this were a film, this would be like one of those flashback sequences. You know when you have them in films and it goes 10 years earlier or something like that. Or sometimes you aren't told that it just goes back. Well, our writer here is saying now before this, so before these events, here's what happened. So this is like a flashback. So Nehemiah had been governor of Jerusalem. We know that. And he supervised the building work and led to the recommitment of the people and the dedication of the wall. So that had happened in these events here. But Nehemiah was still under the authority of the king. He was still under the, the government of Persia as well too. So remember back to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 6. I'm going to know him testing your memory, having you to cast your way back, but you can flick in your Bible if you want to see that. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 6. Nehemiah asked the king for permission to be able to return to rebuild the walls. But what did the king say? Did the king say, that's it, Nehemiah, okay, where you go, cheerio. No, the king says, when are you coming back? That was the king's question. So Nehemiah said he was going to return to Jerusalem and he was going to stay there and do that rebuilding work. And then he was going to come back. So what had happened now Nehemiah has now gone back to Persia to report to the king. But we don't know actually how long he's been gone for. But what we know, he, he's gone for some time. And what we see is in verse 6, actually Nehemiah, when you do the maths and seeing uh, the times mentioned there in verse 6, it shows that Nehemiah had actually been governor of Jerusalem for 12 years. So he returned to Jerusalem and for 12 years he'd been there in the city. So there's all these different manners of, of reforms and so on. But he'd gone back then to report to the king. So we don't know how long he'd been he'd gone for, but we'll talk a wee bit about that. We can have some guesses at that. But you know the old saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And that's what happened. Because here we're warned of the danger of compromise. The danger of compromise, verses 4 to 9. See, while Nehemiah was away, things didn't change. Oh, sorry, things did change, sorry. Things changed and not for the better. And you meet two characters here. Verse 4, there's one, Eliashib the priest. And he was in charge of the chambers, basically the large storehouses. And these chambers, when you, when you, you think of a chamber, I don't want you thinking of just a, a small size room. These things were like almost little small warehouses, some of these uh, chambers as well. So there was considerable space. And Eliashib was in charge of these things. But what he'd done is he cleared out all the items that were used for worship. And instead, he gives this space to a man called Tobiah. Now, the name Tobiah should be ringing some bells with you if you've been to, uh, if you've heard some of these messages before in Nehemiah. Because Tobiah was an old enemy, not just of Nehemiah, but of the people of God and even of the rebuilding work. Though Tobiah was a Jewish name, he was actually, he worked for the Ammonites. The Ammonites, enemies of God's people. He was the one who it says, when you look back at the history of Tobiah, he was a man who was displeased when Nehemiah first arrived. He wasn't happy when he seen Nehemiah coming with all these building materials. He thought to himself, here's trouble. He didn't want this happening. He was one who sought to mock their building efforts. Remember, Tobiah was the one who'd said, you know, look at the wall they're building. Sure, even a fox would knock it down. He mocked even about that. He was the one who plotted along with others. Uh, along with a man called Sanballat and others, he was among those seeking not just to harm Nehemiah, but seeking to put a stop to this rebuilding work. He didn't want it. And yet, here was a man who, this man, Elisha, 
And there's actually many people think Elisha was also the high priest. But many people think this Elisha was actually a different one because the high priest wouldn't really have been put in charge of a storeroom. He had other jobs to do. Uh, Elijah actually was a common name during that time because the name meant about the, it, it reflected about the exile as well. But this man was in charge. This Eliashib was in charge of these large store chambers as well. He was in charge of these store chambers. And here he thinks to himself, we see he's actually a relative of Tobiah. And he thinks, sure, what's the harm in this? Letting this man, um, you know, who's uh, a relative, and he, he was a relative by marriage, and he thinks to himself, you know, maybe Nehemiah was a bit hard to buy. And he thinks, well, sure, what's the harm in him letting him store a few things here? I'm going to read that Tobiah moves in all the furniture. He begins to move in the furniture to this place. And again, here's a man who thinks, what's the harm in this? Here's a man who, who thinks to himself, and actually the rest of the priests would have known this was going on. You know, you think how it is in your street when someone moves into your street. You know, there's the removal vans. And what happens? You see the curtains or the blinds going, who's that? Or, you know, they begin to have a look. They maybe even have a look at the furniture that's going in. And I'm sure that happened as well during the time they were looking. And they knew Tobias' things were getting moved in. They couldn't have missed it. So, actually, others were assenting to this happening. Others who were in charge. So, I want you to realize here, it talks about this is the danger of compromise in verses 4 to 9. Because... What they've actually done is let one of their enemies in. They've let him on the inside. And here he is in the temple, the very nerve center, really, if you like, of Jerusalem. And here he is, and he can potentially have access to other people, other people who were influential too, even the priests. Think about what that influence could have done for the negative, and, and think of the effect that that could have had. And actually, as this chapter goes on, you're going to see actually the effect that this had. Now, Nehemiah, he's all the time, he, now he's in Susa at this point. And Susa was 1,100 miles from Jerusalem. So this wasn't, Nehemiah wasn't just taking a wee trip down the road. Nehemiah wasn't just going to the next town. He was 1,100 miles away. And so maybe some of these people thought, oh, Elisha maybe thought, maybe Nehemiah's not coming back. You know, he'd went to the king and he'd been gone for some time. It took him actually... 55, they reckon it would have taken 55 days to get to this place. 55 days. Now, when you do the miles, apparently someone's worked it out. Um, in case you're impressed that I've worked the miles out, I haven't actually. I, I was, wasn't brilliant at miles. But he traveled, if he traveled about 20 miles a day, they worked out, well, that would be actually about 55 days to get to there. So 55 days to get there, 55 to return. And I'm sure he spent some time in between. He maybe even stayed there for, it could have been months. It could have been maybe even a few years. He stayed back in Susa. But eventually, he does return. And when he returns, well, he doesn't like what he sees. Look at verses 78. He describes this as the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah. It's evil to, to make this man a home in the very house of God. He was one who was opposing God's purposes. He was a man who, it was God's purposes to rebuild that city of Jerusalem. And yet, Tobiah had stood in its way. That's why he describes it as a great evil. And to make for him a home in the very house of God. Elisha was supposed to be one of the servants of God, a priest. And instead, he's breaking God's law and he's compromising his people. And when Nehemiah arrives at the temple, well, Nehemiah doesn't exactly do things by half measures. He literally, to say he takes a hands-on approach is quite literal in this passage. He begins to throw out Tobiah's belongings. It's, it's, it reminds me a little bit of the scene where uh, Jesus, remember, entered the temple and how he threw out the money changers. Uh, it's very much like that. Again, Nehemiah is doing the same thing. You know, Nehemiah is removing these things, which, you know, this was meant to be a place of worship, a place of prayer, and yet the people were corrupting it. And so... Uh, Tobiah had desecrated even these things by his very presence, Nehemiah says. And so, um, David, uh, uh, Derek Kidner, sorry, remarks about this section. What, what he does is, he, well, uh, Nehemiah wants these things purified and he wants the proper vessels and offerings back in the rightful place. Derek Kidner says in this section, throughout this chapter, Nehemiah stands out from all his contemporaries by his refusal to allow for a moment that holiness is negotiable 
or that custom alone can hollow anything. In other words, holiness is important. Holiness is critical. It's vital for God's people. If they want to see God's blessing, then holiness is important. And so this was a serious matter. And holiness is an important matter for any of us. We're to be holy because our God is holy. God's holiness should never be treated lightly. And so when worldliness creeps into the church and when believers begin to lose their distinctiveness from the world, that's a problem. And there is a great danger in in compromise because here's the thing, Satan makes it seem like such a small thing. Satan makes it seem like a, a simple action. But yet often one sin leads to another sin. Because what you tend to find is when people sin, if they try and then cover that sin with maybe another lie, and then one sin after they've committed one sin, they think, well, sure, what's, I've done that. What's the harm of, you know, that's how Satan tries to tempt. That's how Satan tries to tempt. He, you know, makes it seem like it's not so bad. But yet, actually, there is a great danger in compromise. If we begin to tolerate sin in our life, because it does begin to spread, And it can lead us to the point where it's taken us even further than we ever thought we would go. So we need to be so careful in the Christian life that we would examine ourselves in the light of God's word. That we would not tolerate sin, but that we would deal with it by repenting and confessing it. We need to be so careful that we don't let the devil get a foothold in our life. For inevitably there is consequences of our sin. Not just for ourselves, but even also for others. And when those in leadership sin, it often leads others astray. And that's exactly what happened. Because what we see here is there's a problem. There was a problem of neglect and worship. That's, if you like, the first effect of this. See, maybe the people, as they saw the compromise of their leaders, and as they saw how lightly Elijah and others viewed the things of God, maybe it caused them to think, well, if that's the way they are treating it, then... Well, what's the harm in in us? And, you know, if the Levites thought that holiness and worship didn't matter, then they thought, why should it matter to them? Their attitude of the leaders began to reflect on the people. And you see, when they first made that covenant to God back in chapter 10, one of the things that they vowed, chapter 10, verse 39, it says, we will not neglect the house of God. And yet that's exactly what they've done. The Levites who served in the temple, they'd been supported, you see, by the people. And that was part of the law that they would give to support the Levites um, because the Levites had no really other source of of income themselves. So that was how they gave towards them as they, they supported them in the work of the priests and Levites. And yet, whenever that stopped happening, the Levites had to return to their, their farms. They, some of them lived in the rural areas around Jerusalem. And some of them thought to themselves, well, we can't do this and this, look how it's been, we're being treated here. Look how people also view worship. They're treating it so lightly. Maybe some of them thought when they saw the attitude of the priests, thought that's enough. They just went back to their own work. They went to work in the farms when they weren't being supported by the people. Do you know what was a disaster for the community? Because worship suffered. Worship of God was neglected. And so Nehemiah confronts those whose fault it was. He confronts the officials in verse 11. And he says, why is the house of God forsaken? And it's the, this wording there is very deliberate because that's what they vowed to do. to not neglect the house of God. And yet they've forsaken it. They weren't supporting those who were, they needed to even facilitate the worship in the temple. And he gathers these officials together and he puts them back in the positions they should have been. He brings the tithes back in the storehouses and instead he appoints four trustworthy men, four trustworthy, reliable men as treasurers to ensure that the Levites were supported. So we see Nehemiah prays this prayer. Now, I wonder, did you notice there is something that's repeated often in this passage? It's actually repeated about three uh, times, really. and, And it's followed after each of these rebukes where Nehemiah prays, remember me, oh my God. He actually prays this a number of times in this passage. And he says, Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and don't wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of God and for his service. See, Nehemiah is a man of prayer. And after each of these rebukes that he issues, they're followed by these prayers for God to remember. Now, what was this prayer all about? It's not implying that God is absent-minded. No, not at all. 
But this prayer that God would remember, God, of course, is one who is all-knowing. He knows all things, and he knows even our needs. But when we pray, it shows our dependence in God. And Nehemiah, what he was doing, even by the rebukes and then setting these things in order, Nehemiah was recognizing, look, I can't do this on my own. I need the Lord in order to, remove, to, to, to work in these people's hearts. He says he's not also self-serving here because we've remembered, we've seen Nehemiah as quite a humble leader. And yet, in putting, he's asking this prayer that, that these things that he's done would remain and not be wiped out. In other words, he's put these measures back in place and he doesn't want to see them slipping back again. That's why he says, Lord, remember what I've done. He's not saying, Lord, give me you know, some uh, special honor for what I've done. That's not what his prayer's about. He was saying these measures he's done in promoting the holiness of the people and pro in promoting the worship He's asking, Lord, may they prosper. Lord, bless them. So Nehemiah is one who's a servant of God. He's not looking for the approval of men, but the approval of God. That God would bless. That God would keep these things. But it wasn't just their worship that suffered. You see, the effect of the, the leader's sin had not only caused this neglect in worship, it had caused them to neglect the Sabbath as well. He saw people in verses 15 to 22 not paying attention to this part of the covenant vow. And this was another part of the vow they made. Not just in the, that they wouldn't neglect the house of God, but also that they would keep the Sabbath. And you see, the Sabbath was something that distinguished the Jews from the other nations. No other nation really kept anything like the Sabbath. This was really what was, yeah, this was something unique about God's people. It was a sign of their covenant with God, and God made the Sabbath day holy. Exodus 31, the Lord commanded them to keep the Sabbath because it was to be a sign between God and his people. It was to be a day of solemn rest, a day set apart for the Lord. It was to remind them of, also of their creator. It was this day of rest, but it also pointed towards also this ultimate eternal rest that actually we find in God. This eternal rest which God provides for his people. So it was very important, the Sabbath. But yet, instead of being a day in rest and worship, what Nehemiah saw was, was people bringing in uh, grapes, trading uh, grapes and wine presses. They were bringing in grain, wine, grapes, and figs, and they were loading all these things in their donkeys to sell. He saw even foreign traders coming in as well, trading fish and other things to sell on the Sabbath day with the Jews. And again, Nehemiah confronts them, and notice again what he says, what is this evil thing that you're doing? It was an evil thing because it was against the very word of God, the very law of God. You're profaning it this day. And once more, they're treating lightly the law of God. And so Nehemiah reminds them of the seriousness of their sin. Look at verse 18. Don't you, don't you remember, didn't your fathers behave the same way as you're doing now? And wasn't this one of the reasons in which God judged his people? See, in Jeremiah 17, verses 19 to 27, the prophet Jeremiah warned the people, and Jeremiah was warning them, basically, if you don't change your ways, you're going to go off into exile. And one of the things he warned them about was how they were treating the Sabbath day lightly. They were carrying burdens on the Sabbath and working, and, and this was a day to be kept holy, consecrated to God. But if they didn't abide by this law, Jeremiah says to them, you know, God's going to kindle a fire in the gates of this city, and he's going to devour the palaces in Jerusalem. And of course, they didn't keep God's law. That was how they were in exile in the first place. The Babylonians came in and they did ransack the city. They burnt the city up as well too. And so one of the symptoms of that was, you know, it was because even they weren't keeping the word of God and weren't even keeping the Sabbath. So God judged his people. And he says, do you not know what you're doing? He's telling them, you know, you're going to make the same mistake that the people made before. You know, of course, today we don't keep the, the Jewish Sabbath as they did. The Old Testament law concerning this doesn't uh, uh, apply to us. They had different restrictions, like even lifting and carrying burdens. That was not to be done on that day. And uh, Colossians 2, 16, uh, verses 2, 16 to 17 says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions and food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So the, the Sabbath day that they, the Jews celebrated was, a, was a, a shadow of things to come. But the early church still did set aside a day. It wasn't a Sabbath 
with the, the strict regulations of the old, they had in the old covenant. But it was a day of rest, a day set aside to worship the Lord. They set that aside to worship the Lord, and they did that at a different time than what the Jews did. They did that on the first day of the week. And so it's good for us, too, to keep that principle of a, of a day set aside for the Lord, a day of, of rest, a day where that's set aside to, to worship the Lord. We know, of course, that all our days should be given to God, but we do, we ourselves do need that day of rest. It's an important time to, to meet together, to worship with the Lord's people too. And we don't refer to it as a Sabbath. We refer to it as, as the Lord's day, a day given over to the Lord. It's good for us to keep that principle. And so once more, Nehemiah is confronting these people. They haven't been taking God's word seriously. You know, he orders, he, again, he takes hands-on action. He closes the gates. He says, before the Sabbath comes, the day before, then in the evening of that, you close the gates and don't open them until the Sabbath's over. He'd even given positions to the servants to watch out to make sure people didn't do this. But even the Gentile merchants, they tried to get around it. They were crafty. They thought to themselves, we'll set up our shops around Jerusalem. And Nehemiah literally says to them, you know, um, he warns them, why are you doing this? If you do it again, I'll lay hands on you. That's how Nehemiah, isn't, he isn't pulling his punches as he in this last chapter. But once more, he's showing them holiness as a, as a priority. He commands the Levites to purify yourselves. And once more, after this rebuke, he's praying once more. Uh, verse 22, remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spur me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. He's asking that the Lord would preserve these measures that he's setting in place for the Sabbath, that his people would keep God's word. Remember me, O Lord, for what I've done here. Lord, I'm doing this for you. Lord, may the people stick by this because of your steadfast love. And what's steadfast love? It's a love that doesn't change. And so there was another further issue. You see, here was something else they neglected. They neglected their worship. And again, this started with the compromise. But then, as the people looked at the way the leaders were setting the example, they neglected their worship, they neglected the Sabbath, but they neglected God's word in marriage. See, it wasn't just a problem in worship and their business life. There was trouble at home because they began to see how some of the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And this was a problem they'd encountered before. In the time of Ezra, Ezra 9 to 10, they'd married other nations, something that had been commanded not to do. And as I say, this was not an issue of race. It's not. Because what this issue was, was one that was a threat to their very identity. You see, there was a danger in introducing idolatry into their families if they married the people from these other, um, this other uh, nationality as well. And here, Nehemiah is describing the effect that this was having in the people. So it was an issue of idolatry. Because in marrying some of these foreign women as well, what they were doing was they worshipped idols. They didn't worship the one true God. The Bible, of course, uh, warns us against, uh, against marrying unbelievers. And, and that was the case here. That's what they were doing. They were marrying people who, who didn't follow, uh, who follow God or didn't have faith in God. And what he began to realize is the effect that that was having. The children that were growing up in these marriages couldn't even speak their own language. Now, it's not just an issue of identity. Think of the implications of that through. If they couldn't speak their own language, how would they get the word of God? If the priests were standing up reading from the scriptures, if, if the priests were explaining God's word to them, how were these children ever going to know? They couldn't even understand the words that the priests were speaking. See, this was a serious matter. And it explains Nehemiah's extreme reaction. And look how he reacts in verse 25. He not only confronts them verbally this time, he does use physical violence. He, he beats some of them, even pulled out their hair. Now, Nehemiah certainly isn't advocating the model for church discipline here, let me show you, and let me assure you. But he, he makes them take an oath that, that they wouldn't intermarry, that they wouldn't give their daughters to their sons or take um, their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. And he emphasizes the danger of this. And here's the root, here's the issue of what he's talking about. He uses the example of Solomon, the cautionary tale of Solomon. Solomon, one of Israel's greatest kings, God had given him great wisdom. He'd built wonderful structures. He'd even built store cities. That's how vast 
that, Nea, uh, that Solomon's uh, kingdom even was. You know, maybe you have large cupboards to, to store things in your house. Nehemiah had to build a city. Or not Nehemiah, Solomon had to build a city to store some of his things. He was a man who built these. He was famous. He possessed great wisdom. But yet his heart was led astray. His heart was led astray by even these foreign women. has led his heart astray and led him into sin. They turned him away from God. And so Nehemiah was urging these people, be careful. Don't let the same thing happen to you. Why are you doing this great evil and acting treacherously against God? And they're acting treacherously because they were disobeying God's word. This was a sin against God himself. It was a thing which so easily could have devastated this very nation. And it affected even the highest position in society. Even the high priest was impacted. This Eliashib, Eliashib the high priest, was the son of Sanballat the Horonite. And again, that's another name, should ring bells. Sanballat was another one of the enemies of Israel. And yet, he'd married into this family as well too. But look at Nehemiah's prayer in verse 29. This time it's different. It's not remember me, but remember them, O oh my God. For they've desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. This time it's not a prayer for God's blessing, but for God's judgment. Lord, remember what they've done. They have sinned against you, and they'll be judged for it. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? But I want you to notice how this finishes, and time is moving on, so, so will I. So these last two verses in our chapter, Nehemiah closes with this simple two-verse summary. I cleanse from everything foreign. and I establish the, the duties of the priests, the Levites, each from his work. So he cleansed, he established, he provided He'd done as best he could uh, to ensure the, the pure and proper worship in the temple. And he'd also built in provision to support the priests. I know, in other words, he wanted this worship to continue. And yes, Nehemiah restores proper worship and he seeks to restore Jerusalem again. But he prays, Lord, would you, you bless this? Remember me, oh my God, for good. He's not saying, Lord, give me my reward in heaven for this. But he's asking that God's blessing would be upon what he's done. Lord, may these people continue. That's really what he was wanting. Lord, remember these people. Remember them. Remember what he'd done. He put these measures in place, but he, only God could move in their hearts. Only God could move in their hearts. You see, revival must begin with the house of God first. You can put measures in place, but only the movement of God in people's hearts is what changes things. Do you know, there's tremendous lessons we can bring out of a passage such as this. It reminds us of the danger of compromise. How when we let sin creep into our life, if we ever begin to tolerate that sin in its presence, it can draw us further and further away from God. And you know, backsliding, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight, you know. It doesn't. It begins with, with maybe just, you know, maybe not doing your reading maybe one day or maybe letting it slip for a day or two or a week and before you know it, it's slipped a month. Or not wanting to, if we ever grow lax about wanting to even be in the presence of God's people. That can be a very dangerous thing. You know, I know some people can't be here for, for health reasons. But, you know, for, for others who could be here and maybe who don't even show a desire to be here. If there's something wrong with our appetite for God's word and for God's people, there's something wrong. You know, it is a cautionary tale as well. And we need to, to be careful in our Christian life. It impresses upon us the importance of holiness. And that matters greatly to the believer because we're to be holy for our God is holy. If we want to be blessed, if we want to be fruitful, you know, we need to be living lives that would honor God. We also need to be praying. See the importance of prayer in the book of Nehemiah. See, the book of Nehemiah, as we close, like Ezra, it's a very challenging book. And we saw that it's not just a book about a rebuilding project. It's actually about a spiritual restoration of the people. That's really what this book is about. And in order for the people to move forward, they needed to re repent of the sins of the past, both of the present and the past. And one commentator comments, in order to have lasting results in reform and revival, it's going to require constant renewal, but constant courage too. It takes work to maintain the proper priorities. 
And God used a man, Nehemiah, a man of vision, a man of prayer to lead these people to bring this restoration. But we need the same faith that Nehemiah possessed. If we want to see revitalization too, we need to be praying. Praying, believing, and not give up. I'm praying without doubting. We have to believe that if God did it before, he can do it again. You know, what a good prayer that is. Lord, you've done it before. Do it again. The book of Nehemiah begins with prayer. How does it finish? With a prayer. What's right the way through it? Prayer. We need prayer. Prayer was a feature in every circumstance, whether it was the time of celebration, whether it was the time of trial, whether it was time of discouragement. We need prayer to be a feature of our lives. And Nehemiah, above all things, was concerned for not his glory, but God's. I mean, the same be said of us that we be a people of prayer, that we be a people seeking to be, build, play our part in building God's kingdom on earth for his glory. And so let us even pray that, pray that prayer of Nehemiah. Remember us, O God, for good. May God bless this word to our hearts today. We're going to sing together in just a little moment, but let's pray first of all. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord. We as we've seen in the book of Nehemiah, you changed the hearts of these people. And, but Father, they were prone to wander. They were. They slipped back into some of the same old sins even that they committed before. And Father, help us not to, to compromise in our life, to fix our eyes upon you, Lord. Help us not to tolerate the presence of sin in our own hearts, to not let things fester in our life, but to repent of them and confess them to you. Father, we ask that you would remember us, Lord, that you would, would work in our lives as individuals, but as a church as well. And Lord, we ask, we would long even that we too would be revitalized as well. We do pray for others even around in our area. We pray, Lord, that people would come into our church, but that we also would go out and also seek to bring them in. Help us, Lord, as we do that. And Lord, may Nehemiah's prayer be ours. Remember us, O oh God, for good. Help us, Lord, even as we meet around this table. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the thing in the book of Nehemiah was also the sovereignty of God. How God moved. And God moved in many ways in which they didn't expect. Think of it, uh, I used, he used a king. A king to even allow his people to return and provide even for that building work. God worked in so many amazing ways. And so our last time reminds us of that sovereignty of God. He is sovereign over us. Just stay seated even as we sing this. There is strength within the sorrow There's beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting You're sanctifying us Standing, you're teaching us to trust. Oh, your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful for. Could I? 
high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lowly Compassionate and kind You surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight Oh, your plans are still to prosper Forever high priest. 
He's a forever high priest. You know, at that time, uh, previously, you know, whenever, under the old covenant, there were many high priests. There could only ever be one high priest at a time. But basically, when one high priest died, another took over from their, the, that family. But, you know, that high priest role changed. When one died, the other high priest then took over. But yet, Christ, our high priest, remains in this role forever. Because he died and rose again. And he lives eternally. And this means he is a far superior high priest because he always lives to make intercession for us. And also the most, he has an access that no other high priest ever had. You know, the high priest could only enter on the Day of Atonement. They could only enter the holy place on the, only on that day. That's the only time they could enter the most holy place. But yet our high priest, Jesus, he is in the very presence of God forever. He is able to not only go there, but remain there. And so he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. He's not only a forever high priest, he's a, he's a fitting high priest. Because he's uniquely qualified to hold this position. The ultimate mediator, the one who is truly God and truly man. The one who is able to intercede on our behalf. It was fitting, it says here, that we should have such a high priest. He's also a flawless High priest. Verse 26. He's holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. You know, we didn't read the next verse after that, but it goes on to say, all the other high priests, when they made their sacrifices of atonement, well, they had to make an offering for their own sins first. But yet, our Savior, Jesus, he didn't need to make that offering. He didn't need to bring some offering along. He himself became that offering. He had no sin. He was spotless. He didn't need to make an offering for his sins. No, he went to the cross for our sins. And he didn't just give of an offering. He was the offering. He is the forever high priest, the fitting high priest, the flawless high priest. And you know, as we looked at this passage today, we've seen of hearts that were drawn away. You know, each of us knows what it is to be tempted. But yet, and sometimes we aren't what we should be. We feel maybe like the hymn writer who said, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Praise God, we not only have a high priest who is flawless and fitting and forever, but he's a forgiving high priest. One who knows what it is to be tempted, but yet he is one who very importantly is without sin. He is one who lives to make intercession for us. And so we can find mercy and grace to help in time of need when we draw near to him. Do you know, I don't know what the previous week has, has brought in your life. I don't know even what's going through your heart and your mind, even as you're, you're here today. Maybe you're coming keenly aware of your own guilt and shame. But in these moments of stillness, let us take that time to confess even of our own sin before the Lord. To just pray to him silently and ask the Lord would cleanse us. That he would cleanse us and forgive us. And that it would help us to live for his glory. We're going to give thanks shortly for the emblems. And these emblems remind us, remember of this passage that, which teaches us the significance of them. That Jesus, when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he took it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Around this table in remembrance of your crucifixion for our sins. Lord, we just lay anything which is not pleasing in your sight before your cross. 
and we ask you to lead us gently through helping us to recognize sin when we see it in our lives. Lord, we thank you that your body was broken for us. It was broken in our place that we might have salvation. Lord, we thank you that we are not praying through a mediator. We are praying straight to the Lord God above. So, Lord, we just thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation and help us never to forget the broken body that you had to endure to pay for our sins. So be with us now as we take this bread and bless it to our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go here on our Sunday around your table spread, we give you thanks that we are able to go here together as your people and to remember what you've done for us. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry, now in heaven lifted high. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Lord Jesus, it says everything. You came here to this world of sin. You gave your life freely. You hung, you died. You shed your blood for the remission of each of our sins. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks as we take of this cup, this cup, the emblem of your spilt blood. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you came, you reached, you saved each one of us. For our sins in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son to be that fitting high priest. 
that he is one who remains in that position forever. That he is one who is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him. And that he lives to make intercession for us. Father, we do want to give you thanks. And we can declare what a wonderful saviour that he truly is. And so, Father, just even as we part now and as we gather once again, even tonight, to meet around your word, Father, prepare our hearts even to receive it. And Lord, even bring others in even to your service as well. And so, Lord, be glorified in us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.